Okay, well, we're on air, so let's start. Good evening, attendees uh, out there in Webland. I'm Howard Mandel. I'm president of the Jazz Journalists Association. You are attending uh, the JJ's first Talking Jazz panel discussion, first of a series of five that we'll be doing monthly. We're uh, webcasting from the luxurious Jazz Journalists Association studio in the clouds. And uh, tonight we have with us Adrian Ellis, Gene Dobbs Bradford, Megan Stabile, um, uh, who are going to be talking about where will we be hearing jazz. And uh, just to introduce everybody, I'm going to ask you each to say hello in your own voice and tell our listening audience or viewing audience um, what your participation is in presenting jazz or in consulting about it. Adrian? Well, I'm Adrian Ellis. Um, I am a jazz fan of a deep and obsessive interest. Um, I also am professionally involved in jazz in various ways. I ran Jazz at Lincoln Center as the executive director from 2007 to the beginning of 2012. Um, before that, whenever I had the opportunity to work with a jazz organization, I did. I worked extensively with SF Jazz, uh, still do in various uh, ways, and uh, I go and see a lot of jazz whenever I can. And Megan, please. Uh, yes, my name is Megan Stabile. I'm president and CEO of the Vive Music Group. Um, I've been presenting uh, concerts based around the kind of fusion, organic hybrid and fusion between jazz and other genres of music, um, you know, premiering different artists together uh, in different styles of music, you know, for example, Roy Ayers and Pete Rock, um, the Robert Glasper Experiment and Mo Staff, and we've done a lot of other, you know, major productions um, that involve, you know, taking different artists catalog and reinventing um, you know, series of ideas and concepts through, um, you know, working with, you know, younger musicians and um, kind of presenting a, a new idea in modern uh, jazz with a lot of the, the kind of next generation of, of musicians. Um, and uh, recently started um, working with the president of Blue Note, Don Waz, um, where I was signed as uh, executive producer to start working on records. So. Um, we're doing a few different things in concert productions and also uh, live albums and records. And we also have a site that is dedicated to musicians, um, which is also OK Player's Jazz Blog. And you can go there um, by going to okplayer.com and clicking on Revive Music. And Gene, do you want to introduce yourself too, please? <clears throat> Yes, I'm Gene Dobbs Bradford. I'm the executive director of uh, Jazz St. Louis. We're a not-for-profit organization here in St. Louis that focuses on jazz, performance, education, and outreach. We have um, a concert series that we present at our flagship venue called Jazz at the Bistro, where we do about 272 performances every year. And we also have education and outreach activities that reach over uh, 11,000 students every year. Some of those uh, educational activities are activities that teach uh, students how to play jazz, and others are, are uh, activities that expose them to the music. Uh, I've been the executive director since 1999, and uh, we have a, a budget of about $2 million. Wow. Uh, okay, I want to say also, just before we get started, that we want to thank the sponsors of the Talking Jazz series, and that is Century Media Partners, and the Jazz Cruise, and we urge people to visit the Jazz Cruise at thejazzcruise.com. Based also, here in St. Louis, by the way, the Jazz that's Cruise. Right. That's right. Michael Lazaroff is the CEO of the Jazz Cruise, and uh, they've just signed on to the JJ as a sponsor for this whole series, and I think probably next uh, spring's continuation of the Talking Jazz series. I want to say also that uh, people out there can view this panel live uh, either on our website, jjnews.org, that's jjnews.org, and if that isn't displaying correctly, you can also see it on the JJA's YouTube page. Uh, go to the Jazz Journalists Association YouTube page, click on live events. So, um, essentially, Adrian, 
uh, you've been an executive director of a major institution and a consultant to other major institutions that are uh, really putting a big footprint uh, into jazz uh, communities, um, uh, kinds of institutions that we had not seen uh, until about, well, 20 years ago, or I guess 25 years ago in the case of, uh, of Jazz at Lincoln Center. And Gene, you are uh, the executive director of a community-based sort of grassroots jazz organization, nonprofit, and doing a lot of uh, presenting. And Megan, you're an independent producer uh, operating in a commercial context, as I understand it, not a nonprofit. So it seems to me that all three of uh, you um, represent or can speak about some of the changes that are going on in where people hear jazz today. And uh, sort of the uh, premise of our discussion is that um, the the traditional jazz club, the place in the neighborhood that you could go down to and have a brew uh, that may have professionalized itself over the years to be presenting uh, highly professional jazz, maybe touring bands, um, uh, frequently professional touring bands, that that's sort of uh, becoming a difficult uh, local institution to sustain and uh, different kinds of presentations are are taking over or filling in the gaps or adding on to what's available. Um, Adrian, do you see that as being the case? Uh, partly. I think that um, I think that Smaller jazz clubs have probably always struggled in a very hard scrapple life. And I think that that was true and remains true. There's a mixed ecology, if you like, of jazz, of institutions supporting jazz now. Some are for profit, some are not for profit. But, you know, if you're in a major city like New York, then um, uh, you would not. You know, if you're interested in jazz, you couldn't live on a diet of not-for-profit organizations. In other words, a lot of um, uh, the club scene is actually very vibrant in in the whole of New York, all five boroughs, or most of the five boroughs anyway. Um, and so I think it's a bit simplistic to see jazz sort of gravitating from for-profit to not-for-profit. Um, I think the not-for-profit, uh, and the not-for-profit ecology is complicated too. There are the larger performing arts centers who have a sort of strand of jazz, but there are there are some, but not that many, not-for-profit organizations still in you know wherever we are, 2013, that um, uh, that are dedicated to jazz. Uh, Gene has one, SF Jazz, etc. But you know, it's a in the whole of the states, it's not a uh, not-for-profit organizations dedicated to the art form of jazz are not that many still. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but, you know, I think the reality is that the future of jazz isn't either in clubs or not-for-profits. It's all over the place. And, um, you know, the, the, the place that you should, we, sh we should be looking towards are the sort of places that don't just program exclusively jazz, program many forms of music of which jazz is a strand and that brings people into jazz. So I don't think it's really about sort of, you know, genre specific venues are part of the ecology, but they're probably not the most important part in terms of where audiences are going to be coming from. I see. Well, I was going to follow up by going directly to Gene and asking what the um, club mix to uh, ratio to your own presentations is Jazz St. Louis are in St. Louis. Are there active jazz clubs in St. Louis and, and East St. Louis where Miles Davis got his start still? Well, there are more uh, there are more venues that are beginning to program jazz. There is a, a smaller jazz club in town, uh, but, but people who are presenting artists of the type that we have, the caliber that we have, uh, we're the only ones who are doing it really. I think Adrian makes a very good point is that it really is going to be a mix. I think that jazz clubs, much like jazz, is a very individual art form and it's hard to to uh, replicate something in in a in a community that's not really that that's is where it's not really a good fit. So here in St. Louis, 
I think that what we have here in being a not-for-profit works very well for us. This market is relatively small compared to some areas where uh, some not where some for-profit jazz clubs are thriving. And for us, we've uh, been able to make it work. I think that that the non-profit model for jazz clubs does make a lot of sense. But another point that Adrian makes is that um, we've seen how uh, eclecticism can be used to bring people to jazz. And if you look at some of the events that uh, that that are uh, highly eclectic, they're able to uh, draw large crowds to jazz. Uh, by leveraging these other uh, other acts, and that's what uh, young people, the people under 34, are looking for. They've grown up, you know, with uh, with uh, iPods and shuffle and everything. They don't want to be defined as being jazz fans. They would say they like all types of music, and I think the challenge for the jazz presenter is to get into a situation where we say, you know. Us too. Take a you know, uh, try jazz as well as these other things that you're trying. Well, Megan, your whole revive movement has been based on this um, eclecticism and the idea of not branding things as just jazz, jazz, but but mixing genres and inviting younger people in. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. I, you know, my company is called Revive Music Group not revive jazz group, you know, so it's, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting just um, the kind of perspective of the word in particular in itself, but, you know, obviously there's, you know, um, there's a movement in itself with what, you know, the younger generation of musicians has come to kind of, you know, uh, express mm -hmm. through jazz, you know, through, through, um, you know, a style of music that is, you know, ingrained in in them, but also, you know, the younger generation being very much influenced by a lot of different styles of music from soul to funk to hip hop. You know, you're hearing, you know, that um, just, a, just a different evolution in, in the sound itself and in, in the style of music, and that's where you're getting into kind of these, these cross, you know, I guess, um, how did you say it, um, eclectic, more, uh, you know, sounds and with different groups that are, you know, um, really kind of pushing the boundaries with what is even considered to be, you know, understood as jazz music. Um, but, you know, so there, it, but it's still appealing to um, a jazz listener, you know, there's there's still that, that ingrained uh, tradition and, you um, you know, history within within the music itself, and it's something that's just happening naturally. It's not, you know, uh, artists coming together and really, you know, trying to be anything particular or anything specific. It's just what's kind of happening musically right now. Well, we, we've seen this sort of thing before in other cities, of course, and it, you know, the whole uh, history of jazz is uh, to be eclectic and to be embracing many different. Um, dimensions and directions that the music has moved into. I mean, I'm thinking about in the 1980s, there was a, a growth of coffee houses that would feature like world music sort of crossover with improvisation. And groups like uh, Don Cherry, Nana Vasconcelos, uh, Kyle Walcott's uh, Kadona, uh, groups like that that were doing kind of a, you know, that world music with improv thing. Uh, and also in the 90s, places like the Knitting Factory here in, in New York that were mixing, uh, well, I guess you'd call it postmodern, uh, you know, or downtown experimentalism that was coming from a jazz perspective, perhaps, but moving away from traditional um, uh, swing, blues, gospel. So that that seems to be a, a natural part of the... Uh, the evolution of the music. But I wonder, Megan, if you find that you are attracting like a crowd of people who would not be going to a jazz concert for sure, that they just wouldn't even dream of it. And they don't know that they're, I mean, maybe they don't care, but they don't know even if they did care that a revived show has um, jazz affinities. Well, I think in the beginning when we started promoting concerts, um, and producing shows, and you know, 
it's it's all been about kind of providing a platform and kind of being um, the bullhorn for you know this new uh, just great music honestly just really good new music and um, you know we've just come to be it's understood that when you know we're presenting a show and producing a show whether you know it's blurring the lines between um, you know uh, uh, traditional jazz um, and you know your more eclectic sound you know people understand that when they come out it's going to be amazing no matter what but um you know it depends like I'm I'm promoting a show um, with with Jeff Tane Watts you know in a couple in a couple weeks and you know the audience that we kind of cater to they're kind of all over the place you know so you know some of the, the younger kind of um, not your musician audience, your 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 non musician audience, really that's what you're going for to kind of bring into, you know, understanding, you know, any any type of just improvisational aspect of, of this music, you know. Um, or ex uh, music that doesn't always have to involve, you know, a singer or um, an MC or whatever. You know, so we usually have a really a really wide and broad younger audience that will come out to seeing artists like Jeff Teen Watts or um, you know Wallace Roney you know the kind of the artists that don't necessarily always kind of blur those lines but you know it, we still get that kind of you know younger audience to come check them out so um, that kind of outreach uh, to the non Jazz devoted audience, I guess, is is what you've um, uh, succeeded in in drawing in here. And um, if that's the case, then I wonder, uh, Gene, does having an organization called Jazz St. Louis mean that you can't do as eclectic or as uh, widely varied programming because people are expecting to hear? A ching ching ling swing beat, or you know, mostly blues, or something that's very strongly identified with the tradition. Is that well, what I, I, you know, I don't think so. I think with, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> a new panelist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we certainly had a wide range of of different jazz artists. Uh, you know, Bad Plus, Robert Glasper, uh, to things that are very traditional, like uh, John Pizzarelli. And, uh, you know, for us, just making sure that we have that diverse program and being known for, uh, for, for carrying those different styles has been a benefit to us. Another thing that we do is we have a subscription series, and uh, the uh, subscribers that we have have come to trust us over time, so they will purchase, uh, you know, the full series of 18 and come to shows that have uh, artists who are playing very different styles of music. Um, and seeing the, the 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 range of jazz, if we're St. Louis's jazz club, then it's it's up to us to really provide people with uh with exposure to uh a lot of different styles of what people are saying jazz is. You know, I don't really feel the need to to be the jazz police, as it were. But I think if you look at our if you look at our uh, you know our lineup. I think you'll find that it's 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 uh, got a, a nice diversity to it, and that also helps us to draw in diverse crowds. We were very fortunate this summer to participate in an experiment uh, that was funded uh, from the uh, as part of the Jazz Audience Initiative. Uh, it was funded by the Doris Duke Foundation, where we uh, we had learned uh, by doing a um, a jazz ticket buyer report that. Yeah, the people under the age of 34 really embraced uh, eclecticism. They did not want to be categorized. So one of the, and, and the thought was that there are a lot of genre blending performances out there. Um, you know, even things at Jazz and Lincoln Center with uh, with Willie Nelson and and Wynton Marcellus that I think brought a lot of new people to the music. But I wondered if uh, we could do something like what they do at the Winterfest. Where you have, you know, different styles being performed in sort of a, a, a buffet style, if you yeah. will. Well, so you're able to, uh, 
to go, yeah, smorgasbord. You're able to go and sample a little bit. And what we found there when we did that, we had a straight ahead jazz uh, jazz group performing, and the people at fifty six percent of the people who came to that performance had never come to j to jazz at the bistro. And of those people who never come, 41% of them hadn't come to a, jazz, a professional jazz concert at all. So I think that, that, you know, there are a lot of different ways to use the eclecticism to bring people in, and I think that uh, there are a number of things that can work. What, what kind of outreach did you do to uh, reach those audiences that are not used to coming to something that's identified as a jazz show? What we did for that experiment was we programmed a number of other groups. We made it sort of like, a, a, it was almost like a festival where you get a wristband and you can go from, from place to place um, uh, with one admission. And the other groups that were there, we had a blues group, we had a, a folk group, we had a sort of uh, uh, adult contemporary. So we had a pretty broad mix of different styles uh, being performed there. And people came down and since they it, we made it ex easily accessible for them, they sampled a lot of different things that they otherwise wouldn't. The other thing that I want to point out is that 89% of the people that we surveyed said that it had increased their, uh, their desire to attend a live jazz performance. What, what kind of media, advanced media, did you get on that, may I ask? You know, very little. Uh, we did some. We, we did a lot uh, through our um, through our uh, Facebook page. We uh, partnered with uh, the uh, local community radio KDHX and uh, ran some uh, some ads in, in online and uh, and in the uh, RFT, which is the Riverfront Times, which is sort of like the uh, the Village Voice of St. Louis, if you will. Yeah. And uh, you know, it hit the people who were who were ready to who were ready to explore. So, Howard. Yes, go ahead, Adrian. Yes. So this is, in a sense, uh, a jazz nerd discussion, and it's a jazz <laughs> nerd discussion because there's a premise of this conversation: that it's the programming that is driving the audience. And here we are saying, well, you know. Uh, is you know so there's a jazz audience and etc. If you look at most of um, the research that was generated by the um, that uh, exercise that Doris Duke Foundation has funded, it's the total experience that people care about, and the total experience, whether we like it or not, tends to trump, if you like, the core thing that we care about, which is what the music is. In other words, that people are looking for an experience. And they're looking for an experience that is um, tactile, sensual, fantastic, social, and uh, there's some music in it. And, you know, we fetishize, quite rightly, you know, the music bit because we care, and, you know, whether we're the jazz police or not the jazz police. But if you want that larger audience, that larger audience is driven by the totality of the experience from the beginning to the end. And we're pretty awful at that in the jazz sector, actually, because, you know, I mean, I love the vintage of Vanguard, but, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're not up for it, it's an intimidating experience. Um, you know, um, uh, the, the conventions of jazz are, you know, not necessarily straightforward for people. They don't understand when they clap, all the rest of it. So, you know, classical music has this really badly, but jazz has it pretty badly too. And I think that what, you know, creating and building audiences is about a lot, is about us being just prepared to embrace the idea that the programming of what's on the stage is incredibly important to us, but it's only an element of what creates the audience and creates loyalty in an audience that thinks this is a fantastic evening, it's totally memorable, and I want to hang out here and be part of this. Well, I think that's well said, and I, and I also think it's true, and I think that we can look at the um, success of jazz festivals around the country as providing the other kind of experience. You come, you hang out, maybe you go eat, you listen to music, but I would say that if the personally, I think that if it's not good music, people feel that the experience is not something that they're necessarily going to return to. I hope they, that's true. I'm not convinced it's true, but we shouldn't care anyway. We should be, you know, about programming good music. All I'm saying is that programming good music is just 
you know, a sliver Part of, of the audience equation. But it, okay, so let me draw you in on your experience with Jazz at Lincoln Center because it's certainly fantastic that there is a jazz club there, Dizzy's, and that that provides the kind of social uh, uh, noshing, drinking uh, experience that um, the uh, Jazz Audience Initiative that Gene referred to and that you also referred to, Adrian. That um, well, yeah, but uh, it just I, I, before you finish that, I just qualify that absolutely. But that is a jazz club with a jazz yeah. club vibe. It does it well. I think it does it uh, uh, superbly well. But the uh, you know, there's another audience to be had with different with a different vibe where you program jazz too. That's not necessarily what Dizzy's is about, but. You know, it, I think we always at Jazz at Lincoln Center, or you know, on my watch, we're always aware that there's yet another, you know, there's another another layer that we never quite got to, which is about, you know, probably Megan's world in in, in a sense, which Jazz at well, Lincoln Center, both generationally and programmatically, didn't quite get to, doesn't quite get to. Megan, we we actually, um, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, we're actually presenting our first yeah. uh, part concert with. Um, Jazz at Lincoln Center um, next week on John Coltrane's birthday, doing a Coltrane tribute. Um, but they actually, you know, they engaged me to sit down to really kind of come up with some creative programming um, throughout next year. To you know, like they're they're paying attention to that, and and um, you know, we're we're really excited to actually come up with some some different shows that will help to engage that that new newer audience into you know Disney's and other venues. Jazz at Lincoln Center. Well, I, there is three venues at Jazz at Lincoln Center that are used yeah. One's the big concert hall. One is the smaller concert hall where I've gone yeah. to blues bands and, you know, vocalist American yeah. song or book uh, series. And then there's Dizzy's Club. Right. So, you know, I know that there's been an attempt to pitch different programming at different venues that oh. provide a different experience, each of them, for the audience. And, you know, it, it's always seemed to me that um, Jazz and Lincoln Center, like some of the other, well, just sticking to Jazz and Lincoln Center, there are yet other venues within the Jazz and Lincoln, within the Lincoln Center complex, Damrosh Park or the um, yeah. area where Midsummer's Night Dream, um, Midsummer's Night Dance was taking place. There are outside places that provided, again, a different kind of experience. What you're saying is, uh, uh, you know, it could be more of a festival kind of experience. It could have been more of a smorgasbord kind of experience. And I don't know, for whatever reason, Jazz and Lincoln Center didn't seem to engage with those other spaces. Well, yeah. I, hey, uh, I work yeah, yeah, yeah. having our own spaces. Give us a break. Uh, or I should say now, give them a break. But, um, but uh, you know, what's, the, what's fascinating is how little um, crossover there is between the audiences in those different rooms, notwithstanding the programming. In other words, um, people who like Dizzy's tend to like the club atmosphere and want to see music in that, in that atmosphere. There are some people who like to see music, including jazz, in a concert hall environment. And so the fascinating thing about, about that I discovered is that you would, th you know, it's more difficult to get people to move easily between those three rooms than you would think because they have loyalties to the room and the vibe of those rooms. Um, you know, the Allen Room, the smaller concert hall, which is, you know, 600 seats, slightly different. That's probably the most spectacular room in New York. You know, it's the room that looks out over Central Park South. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and you know, I think there are very few people who don't, you know, won't go and see something there. In other words, that room would draw people, irrespective of what you program. But the but the move between Dizzy's and um, uh, the move between Dizzy's and um, uh, and Rose Hall, the 1100 seat, is much less than I, you know, I had expected. People like people, as, and, it, and it comes back to what I was saying earlier, which is that you know. There are people who are looking for a certain experience, the concert hall experience, the club experience, the festival experience, um, uh, the smorgasbord experience, and that experience is as important, or almost as important, in their decision about what to see as the programming itself. Gene, do you have anything to 
because you've been involved in this jazz audience initiative where they've done uh, research about the kinds of venues that people presumably prefer and it seems like the the answer that uh, that I read about from that research was that the small club orientation was was preferable in general is that the well, case yeah there was a, by a wide margin the jazz by the people who who uh, bought jazz preferred informal settings uh, like uh, jazz clubs or lounges and uh, that was especially true of younger uh, younger buyers uh, but also prospects that the thing that came in second I think was the outdoor setting which uh, you know I think both of those things have a lot of uh, a lot of implications about the uh, the clubs and outdoor settings being really appealing portals to jazz for younger music but you know you do wrestle with trying to create a space you know if, if you try to do too much with the space that you have then you're going to end up not serving any one of your audiences too well yeah so you know, you wrestle with wanting to do things in the bistro like uh, taking out all the seats and bringing in maybe some New Orleans funk because if you're sitting down to hear some New Orleans funk it's not a really good experience for you, yeah. right? You wanna you wanna be able to 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 move and groove, right? So if we do that though, and that gets to be a thing, or is it, are you going to get to a point where people don't know what to expect when they come in? Um, and uh, that's something that that we're doing some soul searching about is we're looking to make some uh, do some renovation into the new space to think about how we use it. But I think that there is, you know, we don't have to be limited to our our space for these, uh, you know, for our presentations. And and I think that that matching the the venue to the audience you're trying to reach is is uh, is really key. Megan, do you match an audience? To, I mean, um, match uh, uh, an artist or a group of artists that you're putting out to the venue. Do you have the artist first, or do you have the venue first? Megan, when you're putting mm. on shows. Um, yes, uh, it depends. I mean, mainly I have the, the artist first, but, you know, we... I, I, we work as far as presenting and producing shows. Like, either an artist will come to me and they have this, you know, like, you know, larger vision that we help to, you know, uh, you know, manifest with them, and you know, we'll we'll help build the whole concept for the show from you know point A to point A to point B, and you know, in, in picking the right venue is a part of that, um, you know, and not, but then it depends, you know, the the other side of it is, you know, for example, with Dizzy's. Um, you know, they wanted us to come in to actually curate a show around John Coltrane's birthday for this particular date. So it can work both ways, um, but mainly those kind of, you know, uh, questions from venues will come from more organizations or larger institutions. Um, for example, Brick House, which is a part of Celebrate Brooklyn, um, they came to us, you know, wanting us to kind of curate a uh, a Brooklyn jazz theme, you know, based around Brooklyn jazz artists for their um, their their launch, you know, of their new venue. So we kind of put together this whole big band concept with um, with uh, Oliver Lake and Sean Jones doing the music of Wayne Shorter and Freddie Hubbard. So um, it depends on the situation, but we we're very uh, we're very um, dedicated to you know, being very creative with different concepts and, you know, in collaborating different artists for the purpose of really, you know, doing different things that, that entice people to want to see, you know, jazz presented in a different way. So uh, I knew Brick as a, jazz, a loft, a loft situation. What's their new venue like? I haven't seen it yet. It, it's completely brand new. I think we're one of the first performers, uh, or first, you know, presenters to come in and do something. Um, it's, our, the, the show is on October 5th, oh. uh, when the, our presentation, but I'm, I know that they have a string of events that, that entire week. Uh -huh. Adrian, let me get back to you for a minute. What you described about um, the audiences for each of the three rooms mm -hmm. at Jazz at Lincoln Center, um, 
uh, when you say that there was not that much crossover from the audience, you mean like on all events or on a like on a given night, people wouldn't leave no, no, the no, Allen I mean, room and go over the dizzies? I mean on all events. And I don't want to say there was none, but I'm saying the yeah. percentage of... There were people who are deeply loyal to dizzies um, and for whom um, uh, the... Uh, um, you know, the concert series at, at uh, uh, Rose Hall was a sort of something out there, yeah, that's not, not our thing. And there are others who are loyal subscribers to concert series at Rose Hall. And I think that's because their general way of consuming music was, you know, going to concerts in subscription series. And they could be classical concerts or they could be jazz concerts. But that was, you know, that was their pattern of consumption, if you like, or their pattern of participation. So, so the crossover. All I'm saying is that it always surprised me that the crossover in in program, the crossover of audience, not on a given night, but overall, um, was much less than much less than anticipated. Mega makes a good point, which is, um, you know, the role of the sort of high concept, heavily curated events, um, because I think that the other thing that you know clearly. Um, uh, it, important in driving audience is one of the word buzz that capitalizes on wider media and to do that it's not enough to have great sort of routinized programming you have to think about whether you like it or not a curated angle that generates interest in um, uh, you know juxtapositions of musicians you know Oliver Lake and Sean Jones, whatever it is, you've got to think it. So that sort of curated angle, I think, be, becomes especially, I have to say, uh, in a city like New York, where you're where you're absolutely fighting for attention in an incredibly busy um, cultural world. You have to think about what is it that's going to reach out beyond, as it were, the audience who are going to find you anyway, to some audience that is going to be looking for something that has some sort of zeitgeisty angle. And um, you know, sometimes you get that right, and sometimes it's horrible. But you know, you're all. I think it's. I think that that angle of sort of um, uh, interesting, aggressive curation of events is incredibly important to bringing in new audience. It may not be important to the audience that you have, but it's incredibly important for bringing new audiences in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It attracts different, more media. Yeah, it attracts the media, it attracts curiosity, uh, it, 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 um, it, it creates a discussion, social media too, it and it creates curiosity in a way that even the most fabulous um, uh, you know, quartet of, of absolutely exquisite music um, that's being programmed sort of, you know, and it's Tuesday night in a club. You go in there and your jaw drops at it, but it doesn't unfortunately create the buzz around it that's going to generate those audiences. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you how the artists tend to uh, interact with these sorts of decisions. That's a really good question. Who got, I don't know. Who? Who are you asking? Well, uh, let me describe uh, what brings it to mind. I was at the Chicago Jazz Festival where they did a really good job of uh, uh, curating a vast variety of music, but several of the performances, very highly acclaimed performers, put on music that would have been very difficult for an outdoor uh, venue. Now, they had the audience there because people wanted to come into Millennium Park, downtown Chicago, see the Frank Geary uh, band shell. It's free, uh, lovely evenings at the end of August. But the music could become, um, let me put it, too detailed, uh, not really the broad strokes that uh, work best, in my, in my opinion, in a 10,000 seat, 15,000 seat venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the artist knew what they were going into. It wasn't like a surprise. So um, how do you work with, with artists saying, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to attract, of course, your core audience. We're also trying to uh, please other people who come who may not be a, a core group. And how do you interact with that, with that situation? I mean, I think Megan's already talked about it because you're doing this from the ground up. You're building your shows from the ground up with the artists and with the venues, Megan. Right. 
But that conversation doesn't really happen. I mean, not from my point of view. But our, I mean, the artists that it's kind of it, it's 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 very uh, synergistic the way that the shows, you know, come about. It's either an artist really wanting to develop uh, an idea on their own and need, you know, uh, someone to come in and you know help build it out, or you know, if we're presenting an idea to an artist, you know, uh, it's something that we know that they'd be interested in, and if they're not, um, you know, that that's pretty much said from the beginning. But um, it, that rarely happens because we kind of engage um, like-minded, you know. Gene, uh, uh -huh. uh -huh. did you find that when you did the smorgasbord kind of thing, that people were um, playing to the situation intuitively? I think that people. I think that people were looking for a, 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 you know, looking for the experience that we were providing. I mean, the the audience that we had that came down were the type of people who, uh, who, you know, this is sort of custom made for them. They love music. They don't care what genre it is. We make it easier for them to go from place to place. So it's uh, it's 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 something that I, you know, even if I didn't have anything to do with it, I would really enjoy going to it because. I would be able to get a good value for my money, and I know that with so many different bands, I'm probably going to find something that I like. I think in thinking about these, you know, the highly curated events where you're really getting people to think about something outside of the music, that's something that, that, that we're thinking about a lot these days. I mean, for most of our history, we've just presented, you know, you know presented the artists um, as usual. We haven't done too much in talking about broader themes. But if we want to work with other institutions in town, if we want to create more discussion about it, then we're going to have to do that. And that's something that we realize. Because just having you know, one of the greatest saxophone players in the world isn't enough to generate any sort of uh, excitement in the press. What you need to do is you need to tie it to, to, to other themes. And, and uh, that's something that I think that... Uh, that organizations like Jazz at Lincoln Center and um, and uh, uh, San Francisco Jazz are doing very well. Okay, then Adrian, let me ask: Do 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 institutions such as Jazz at Lincoln Center and SF Jazz have an imperative that they they really have to fill a big hall? They've got a big hall and they've got to fill a big hall. So does that you know somewhat tie them in? to um, the concert uh, production uh, attitude rather than, you know, how can we be flexible here, how can we make it work um, wow. so that we're reaching uh, people who don't want the big hall experience, or et cetera. Well, Jazz at Lincoln Center is very privileged in having more than one venue. And Jazz at Lincoln Center doesn't program jazz in... Um, Rose Hall, the larger venue, every night of the year, or anything like every night of the year. So um, it can creep its integrity in programming. Uh, I think it would be compromised if it all it had was an 1,100-seater and it had to fill it every night, but that's not the um, premise. Yeah. Of, uh, you know, that's not the business model. Also, it is only 1,100 seats. It's not... If you look at the, the normal... Classical concert hall is between 1,800 and 2,100 seats. That's big. I it's I think one of the smart decisions of Jazz at Lincoln Center. I think it was Winton's, and I think it was made at the time uh, of planning was we don't want a 2,200 seat concert hall, even though people argue that the economics of that were much better. Because the reality is that is a even in a city of you know eight ten million people with another eight million tourists st stacked on top of them, filling a two thousand seat venue, and having the right acoustics and all the rest of it's challenging. So yeah, it's a big venue. It's not enormous. San Francisco SF Jazz's venue, even its largest venue, it's got two venues. Don't forget a smaller one is smaller. And I think that those decisions were made with some sort of you know pretty good understanding that if you you know uh, uh, you will kill yourself if you want to program jazz and uh, on a regular basis and all you have is a single large venue. So yeah, of course the size of the venue, the atmosphere of the venue, everything about the venue does and should affect programming decisions. But I think I think you know 
there's there's you know quite a lot of flexibility because of the because of in both cases they've got a choice of venues to use and you know you don't program something in 1100 seat that's only going to pull you know 200 people no. um, or, um, crazy uh, I want to take this opportunity to remind our viewers that you can ask questions type them into um, the panel on the same page at uh, jjnews.org I will read those questions and introduce them into the conversation when they seem appropriate. Um, um, can I come back on one thing? Sure, which is, please. Uh, which is sort of high concept programming, uh, which um, you know, Janet Lincoln Center to some extent is about. Uh, Megan is about. Um, uh, Gene has just been commenting that you know, if he wants to have a dialogue with other cultural institutions, he's got to put things thematically, etc. Um, uh, we were talking about that we need to get buzz from it. It's not all good. I mean, some of it's good because it does a lot, but there are a lot. But what it does do is um, it can undermine, you know, the solid core of, of of programming. Because in a sense, you know, there's a, there's an expression festivalization, and what festivalization is is when you tie a bow around everything and you only do it in the context of festivals. What happens to musical life between the festivals when you know you've sort of um, uh, you've sort of weaned, you know, um, weaned your audience onto high high concept stuff, and they're they're left there waiting for the next big buzz. I don't know what you do about it because I think the reality is when you're looking for an audience, you do that. But I remember once sitting on a panel. I'm trying to remember uh, who uh, uh, with who in a discussion. I think it was 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 like it was Mulgrew Miller, and um, he talked about. Um, uh, oh yeah, that's grant music. And what he meant by grant music was, yeah, that's the sort of high concept stuff you do in order to secure a grant. It's not necessarily, you know, uh, what we would be about spontaneously. So there is a, you know, there's a programming issue in as we as we, you know, heavily curate things. There is a programming issue in there that's not necessarily entirely healthy. Right, and, and I saw several examples of that, I must say, at the Chicago Jazz Festival, for instance. And having everything under the rubric Jazz Festival that um, ranges from um, uh, Wadada Leo Smith doing Ten Freedom Summers with uh, String Quartet, yeah. as well as his uh, jazz ensemble or improvisational music ensemble, and Stafford James with Mboom and a String Quartet and an electric guitarist and a second bassist, where Stafford uh, spent 50 minutes playing arco bass in front of a very muted uh, ensemble, very muted uh, and boom percussion ensemble, uh, and then Jason Moran doing his Fats Waller dance show, which uh, really took over the stage with the dancers, almost to the exclusion of interest in the instrumental music going on. I mean, these things all for, for a festival audience must be a little confusing because some of them are saying, gee, I don't know who Fats Waller is, but if that's what it is, yeah, I don't think I'm interested. Or uh, what is this string quartet doing with this abstract trumpet playing, and I'm walking out on that. Or, uh, you know, what is jazz after all? Is it all these things? I mean, I would assume that a festival is supposed to be uh, giving people a taste and then those people uh, decide what they like and in the intervening year they go pursue what they found they liked in other venues. Wait, but man. it's also turning people off and it's also um, uh, confusing the issue about what they're really getting. So they don't know where to look for it. Maybe, but I think, you know, uh, that's maybe what a festival once was, but isn't it true now that when we go to things, we 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 have a pretty good idea. Everybody will just go to YouTube, they'll go to Spotify, they'll go to Pat, they'll go somewhere, and they'll have some idea, even if it's just walking up to the venue. In other words, we're we're all primed now somehow. It's so much easier to be primed about things without having to make a big investment of actually turning up and going to see it to see whether you'd like it. Hmm. Megan, do you think that your audience checks things out before they come? Um, like do like they do research? 
Yeah, I mean, if you're I mean, saying, well, we're having uh, Oliver Lake and, and um, Sean Jones, do, does a large number of the audience say, well, we want to see who those people are? We never heard of them. Or do they just trust they're going to come to a revive show and it's going to be fun because revive shows are always fun? Yeah, I think the trust is there at this point. But we also have, you know, with our website, um, which is uh, an editorial component of everything that we promote, um, you know, we kind of we come up with a lot of creative marketing um, concepts and strategies to promote our shows. So we'll do, you know, uh, two weeks to a month of, you know, um, different articles, interviews, features to kind of prep our audience to get to know uh, uh, the different artists that we're promoting the show, what the, you know, the concept itself, um, uh, you know, uh, the special guests. We'll, we'll do as much as we can to kind of, yeah, to prep to prep the audience to be more intrigued if they don't know what it is. And I mean, and that's also another uh, part of our foundation is really, you know, um, making sure that people know what they're getting into. I mean, I think the point is just to get people to come and experience this great show. It's also to understand who these musicians are at the end of the day. Um, you know, who who is the band leader? Who who's playing? Who's on drums? That same drummer is also touring the world with, you know, uh, Pat Metheny, or you know, uh, you know, who's that bass player? Um, who's who's the guy that just you know? Did this roaring solo um, that they don't know, and it's it's our job to make sure that people walk away knowing and understanding. Um, not not everybody's going to do the research, you know. Um, so, well, let me bring in a couple of the comments that we've been getting from uh, civilians out there. Um, someone writes, so the discussion seems to be about entertainment seeking an audience rather than a community seeking its music. And can Megan talk a little bit about the visual aspect of Revive's marketing, like the great poster art for the upcoming Coltrane tribute? It's kind of funny that somebody brought that up because um, uh, I, I, I kind of wanted to bring that up as well. Um, I think, you know, one of our, about uh, eight years ago, is it eight years ago? Seven or eight years ago when we first started presenting concerts, um, we also partnered with a young designer who is, he's a musician, his name is um, Roland Nicole, and he has been, you know, uh, his his artwork and his designs have been kind of the face of our, our brand. And, um, you know, we've, we've found a way by partnering together to really kind of uh, express, you know, uh, express in a, in, a, in a design, in, a, in, a, in an artful way, really what people are going to experience. Um, I wish I had an example to show you right now, but, you know, our, our branding and everything that we produce, it's, it's, all, it, it's all cohesive. Um, the aesthetic of the music is also the aesthetic of the artwork that, that is presented. So everything is one. And, and I think that is really important when you're talking about presenting an idea, presenting... Um, a concept trying to make people really walk away with a sense of understanding what they're going to be getting through your brand. So, I mean, that's a larger discussion in itself, you know, branding and, and marketing. Um, I, I'm not, I don't remember what the other question was. Well, it was the, whether we are talking about um, uh, presenting entertainment uh, to an audience, seeking an audience for particular entertainments, or are we talking about the fusion of community and music. That is a, a community that's discovering the music it likes and sort of um, gravitating to that regularly. And I think, I mean, the revived model is very community oriented, wouldn't you say? You've got a. Yeah. A group, I, yeah. I, well, what I was going to say earlier um, about, uh, as Adrian brought up, the when you. Um, kind of overdoing it with the theme-based, concept-based, larger presentations. Um, I don't think that that's the point, you know, in, you know, in trying to get, you know, larger audiences. I think that's just, you know, 
a great way to you know make a make a a large make a, a louder noise about about something specific. But um, and I think anything that is done too much is is you know there's got to be a, a fine balance between you know the proper ways in in getting people to to come to this music. Um, whether however you look at it, you know. Adrian, I think, um, I mean, Gene's model is also uh, reaching to a large community and providing the community with options, I guess, is, is sort of what he was saying in the uh, Smorgasbord uh, element. But do you think that the um, institutions are more locked into um, trying to identify an audience for each show as opposed to building a jazz at Lincoln Center following. I mean, I know there's subscribers, and, and certainly I see the same faces when I go to a lot of the Lincoln Center uh, Rose Hall shows, particularly. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, it was my wife sneezing in the background. Bless you. Uh, um, <laughs> Bless you, Mrs. Uh, Ellis. <laughs> so, so um, uh, yeah, I think... Um, Actually, I, I think that's a false dichotomy because um, sure. when you're building an audience, you know, it's not about transaction. It's about a relationship. And we sort of, you know, the transaction is, there's, hang on, there, is, there, are, there are transactions, especially in New York. In New York, you have a tourist market. The tourists come to New York. They want a quintessential New York experience. What's that? That's jazz. It's the Big Apple. It's a view of um, Central Park, etc. And you know, we Jazz at Lincoln Center provides that. That's a transaction. They'll probably come once. They want to have a great time. They want it to be memorable. You want them to go back to their hotel and tell the concierge it was a fantastic time. So when the concierge, you know, when the next uh, tourists come along and ask the concierge, what should we do? We're in New York for two days. They do it. That said, that's a small part of the, that's a small part of the totality. Most of the totality is about a relationship. So how, the relationship is based on a lot of things. It's based on things that got nothing to do with the music, customer care, you know, um, uh, uh, pricing, all sorts of things. But it also has to do with the music, and it's not only about the quality of music. It's about what their expectations are, and you know, there are different. I mean, one of the interesting things is. Um, uh, do you program in a way in which even if the artist, even if the audience doesn't know the specific artist, they have confidence that the music will be within certain boundaries. They couldn't define those boundaries. Right. But, but um, th they'll understand that that will be a great experience that broadly is of a certain type. And that's incredibly important. And I think the great programming has a consistency and an innovation to it. It has consistency because um, people trust, they have bought into the brand, whatever that brand is, and they have confidence that even though they don't know the artist, they're prepared to go. That's incredibly important because otherwise, if you're not doing that, you're selling on the name of the artist. And unfortunately, in jazz, it's now almost impossible to sell on the name of the artist. Why? Because we all know that there are only six or seven artists in the whole of jazz that have the sort of resonance now that you can sell on the name of the artist confidently. So you're often selling on their confidence in that intermediate brand, revive, whatever it is. And so you've got to know both how to, um, how to uh, build that, but all the same time how to play with that too, so that you're not simply saying, oh my god, all we're going to do is, you know, X every time. They've, you've got to know exactly what your, and this is why it's relationship and not transactional, you've got to know enough about what that relationship is to know how far you can push it, how far you can quote, you know, it sounds very patronizing, but educate your audience at the same time that you're giving them confidence that they're going to have an experience that was within their comfort zone or just on the edge of their comfort zone. So um, I don't know whether that's an answer, but that's, you know, that's what I think, you know, that's the, I'm not a programmer, but that's the art of great programming, which is to have a relationship with, you know, as, as the, you know, the questioner said, with a community where you know what their boundaries are and you know how you can play with those boundaries. And I think, uh, you know, picking up on the relationship, I mean, one of the reasons why I think we're successful is that by having a, a small, you know, we are a 150-seat venue, and we go down and we spend a lot of time talking to the ticket buyers. A lot of them do give us their trust, and they'll come down to see a show that uh, with an artist that they know nothing about because 
they trust us and they know that it's going to be very different from the last thing that they saw. Mm -hmm. But you know, taking the time to talk to them and talk about what we value in uh, in the music that we're presenting goes a long way. And we actually did another experiment this this uh, past summer with our subscription drive, where we took time to do uh, season preview parties and just sit down and go by artist by artist on the season and talk about what we like about their playing and what we're what we're listening for and we actually saw a 20 percent increase in our subscriptions and most of that is kind of well a good portion of that is coming from current subscribers increasing the amount of tickets that they're buying and also getting their friends to come in so that relationship is the key driver uh, for 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 making that happen and we're you know it's some of the people who came in at first were the people who were looking for jazz, and uh, and we had something for them. But now we're we're able to get people who are just looking for a mu a, a good musical experience. Well, it it seems like you're all sort of saying that. And one of our guests commented also, uh, whoops, that um, they'd been watching, uh, especially what Megan's been doing, and it seems like what she's successful with is that she's not restricting herself to traditional jazz audience promotion, but reaching out to people who love music, period. And I think that that's, that seems to be what you're all saying, and, you know, yet holding on to some core of, well, it's you're not going to put on Beyonce, or you're not going to put on Dr. Dre, or, you know, uh, unless they want to come play at the club, uh, if you wanted to come play at the club, we'd consider it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, someone also asked um, Adrian if uh, more people knew that they got half off the night of uh, their bigger concert um, experience at Jazz at Lincoln Center in the Rose Room, that they get half off if they go to uh, Dizzy's, that there might be more crossover. Was that? Yeah. Uh, was that pushed? That discount? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, it's not my game anymore. Um, uh, probably not. Probably should be a little more. But um, you know, that that depends on availability. And Jazz at Lincoln Center is in the happy position at the moment um, of uh, you know, actually, there's not always availability, so you can't guarantee those things. Uh -huh. And if you uh -huh. do guarantee them, then there's a, there's always a danger that you know people hold back from buying the ticket because they they can see the way you know through to the half price. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a reasonable point. It could be more crossover. Joe Harrison, who's one of the JJ members in Philadelphia, asked, "Well, can you indeed tailor your programming toward your target market?" Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yes. yeah, one of the things if we wanted to if we wanted to see more young, uh, you know, more young people coming out to the concert, then we know that there are, there there are artists that we can program. That are going to generate that. Uh, if I mean, looking through, I think there are there are core groups for all of the all the artists that we have. That if you book them, I can pretty much tell you the type of audience that's going to show up. And for us, what that means is to, to make sure that we have something for all those audiences represented in what we play. I think the biggest challenge is generational. The biggest challenge is creating a vibe and programming that simultaneously appeals to people for the sake of argument um, under and over 35 or so. Um, because um, basically, you know, uh, the people on the wrong side of that are tending to look for, uh, are tending to look for a particular experience. They tend to be, you know, comfortable genre specific. They tending to, um, uh, they are, as it were, the older, you know, understood jazz audience. I think that the next generation has got a completely different set of expectations. They're much less interested in, you know, genre specific, if you like. And I think that, you know, you, I think that moving with confidence to know that you've got that younger generation requires a programmatic approach that it's difficult to hold the older generation on. I'll give you a very trivial example. In, um, um, you know, if you've got a concert hall and somebody arrives late in it, what do you do? Do you let them in just when they arrive, or do you wait until the, as conventionally concert halls do, until the end of the, um, 
the uh, you know the end of the piece, so they can come in between two pieces. Um, if you talk to an older audience, they will get very upset if you just have open entry and people just arrive when they arrive. If you talk to a younger audience, they're completely irritated by the idea of hanging around and waiting to go in. So who you know which convention. You know, whose convention are you going to uphold? Are you going to uphold the older generation who have to stand up and are very irritated because people aren't punctual and they don't arrive? Or are you going to, um, are you going to program for uh, the younger generation and the older ones will be harumphing and saying, what are all these young people doing, just milling in and out, getting up, you know, using their, um, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, texting one another, etc. I, For me, the... You know, one of the biggest challenges, how do you make an experience which, you know, is intergenerational? I think that's really programmatically challenging. Well, uh, that leads to a question that we're getting from our friend Dr. West from the Jazz and Democracy Project also, is whether, uh, and he, he asks you, Adrian and Gene specifically, um, are you doing, uh, uh, thinking about secondary education uh, markets as uh, part of the programming? Are you pitching things to people who cannot go into uh, uh, alcohol-related situations like Megan, most of them? Um, where a large part of the revive uh, movement takes place in bars that people under 21 can't get into in New York, presumably. Um, we take so, uh, you know how much? Yeah, so how much secondary education uh, market are you are you shooting for that way? Well, yeah, I mean, we take a lot of the young, uh, the artists who perform at the club go out into to schools on a regular basis to do in-school performances and. A lot of it is play and talk. Uh, we also bring um, jazz reach in to um, you know for, uh, to do a series of youth concerts here, uh, and uh, you know that's very important because you know it's it's one way to to connect with that audience. Unfortunately, it's a drop in the bucket, and. You know what we really want to see are more kids performing, uh, you know, or even playing jazz, or getting some of the rudimentary uh, concept of jazz at a very early age. And um, that's that's uh, in an age where everybody's very concerned about standardized testing. Uh, programs that are that are more culturally based are getting forced out. Well, I know in Chicago that the Jazz Institute of Chicago has done a good job in working through the parks department. So instead of going into the schools, they're having after-school programs or weekend programs uh, that are family-oriented or even just kid-oriented, uh, where kids can go hang out for uh, for free or for very cheap. Is that a responsibility of a jazz institution? Well, it's the responsibility probably of most not-for-profits. I mean, it depends what their mission is. But if you're a not-for-profit organization in jazz, then, yeah, I would be very surprised if you didn't embrace a pretty serious commitment to education in various forms, after school, uh, in school, whatever you can, you know, scrape the money together and secure the funding to do. Um, if you look at... Um, people's subsequent involvement in an art form, whether it's visual arts, whether it's classical music, whether it's jazz, the biggest single determinant is whether they're exposed to it, you know, in, in um, childhood and um, um, school days, uh, whether that's in a formal context or informal context. The biggest single thing driving the decline of traditional classical audiences is uh, exactly what Gene's alluding to, which is that the guts have been, you know, not just one generation, but two or three generations that, you know, the guts of music education and arts education in schools have been systematically defunded. So to, you know, to some extent, not-for-profit organizations can make up some of the slack of that, only a small part of the slack, and where they do, that's what creates lifelong music lovers. You know, um, uh, that's what, uh, you know, uh, Playing an instrument in band, whatever that, that that's the beginning of you know a relationship to the music that goes beyond the superficial. And even if people wander off for a while, they often circle around and then come back to it. So uh, so the answer is yes. You know, it, it strikes me, and I've I've made this point to uh, numerous jazz educators that uh, jazz education's focus on teaching instrumental skills is a fine thing. But there are also ways of exposing people to jazz that doesn't, or any music, that does not require them to, list, to learn how to play. 
And um, I don't know how much, uh, I mean, like Gene's mentioning having those pre-season meetings. Well, I suppose that those are listening meetings, right, Gene, where you're uh, putting up the artist or playing a CD from them or something in order to discuss what's going on beforehand? Yeah, it's funny because in the last one we did, we actually didn't play selections from all the artists. I think we only did about a third of them, but we talked just in general terms about what we liked and 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 uh, you know really encouraged them to to come and hear it for themselves. Was that a ticketed event? It was. Uh, it was. It was not. It was uh, something that we we opened up. It was uh, by by invitation. We did one by invitation only, and then we've opened up a couple to the uh, to the general public. Adrian, do you think that the uh, is that cost prohibitive to have? Uh, you know, non-performance events that are enhancement events. No, uh, it's not cost that difficult for the space. Not at all. And I think that you know, if you look around, most you know, uh, certainly most not-for-profits and even you know, for-profits do that. And it, everybody, you know, I think is highly attuned to the idea that uh, the more accessible you can make the performance. The more um, uh, porous, as it were, the greater people can see round the corners at the artists, at the instruments, whatever else. Then the more they will be engaged. So you know, the artists who, and that's why most artists now are also educators, and most artists are, you know know that they've got to be able to speak, uh, uh, be able to speak to an audience, and you know that that's part of their sort of professional tool bag, whether they you know like it or not. And I, I. Quite understand why some artists are irritated, and they think that you know we should be judged on our um, solely on our um, competence and musicianship. But the reality is that most artists, in order to create uh, a relationship with an audience that will carry them through, have got to be able to engage with that audience in very in you know pre-concert talks, in post-concert talks, in hang sets, in you know whatever else that makes them uh, that that gives people routes through to. You know, uh, past the sort of glossy facade of performance. Do you know whether uh, jazz educators are moving towards that realization also? Uh, I probably not. I don't know. What else? Yeah, yeah, I know it's one thing that they. I know it's something that 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 you hear mentioned, you know, in in panel discussions. But the and not only for uh, for jazz musicians, but but uh, for for classical musicians. You know, they're. You know, I think that people want that access to the artist. They really. It's somebody going into, and I know that the St. Louis Symphony has a program where they're sending uh, artists out into the community to do, um, to, to to make them more accessible, and it's it's very successful for them because meeting the 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 artist who used to be. You know, on a stage and and have no contact with the audience is now sitting there telling you all those uh, all those questions that you that you wondered for so long about how long it took for them to to gain that level of proficiency, what they like to do, and what type of music they like to listen to other than the music that they perform, things like that. It really breaks down the barriers, and and I think that that uh, more and more more and more artists are realizing that. Megan, do you? There are tiny things, you know, like um, it's difficult if if you're around the music all the time and you know your way around it. It's difficult to imagine how sort of inaccessible, you know, just you know, uh, twelve bar blues structure or you know, thirty two bars or whatever else, or even just a musician doing that, you know, saying we're going back to the head, you know. And uh, and suddenly people see that and they go oh wow you know and so anything that just begins to give people and you and that can be done so easily and so straightforwardly um, and I think that um, uh, we don't do anything like enough of that a lot more of it is done now than has been done historically and it creates route through it just gets people sort of I always have this you know image in my head of an elevator and. You know, once the people are on the elevator, they can find their way around. And at the top of the elevator, they know what color socks Duke Ellington wore in 1932 and all the rest of it. But, you know, those guys can look after themselves. 
what you need a device is just to nudge people onto the elevator at the beginning so that they're curious and then their curiosity will carry on and often it's really simple things that just begin to make you know a music which is often inaccessible a little more accessible and we forget how you know superficially inaccessible it is even if it's beautiful it's still somehow inaccessible well, I, I, you know, I agree with that, and it, it does seem like there are simple things that can be done to reduce some of these problems. I mean, it occurs to me, Adrian, when you mentioned the thing about do we let in people late? Well, why are we having ticketed uh, seats? You know, the people who get there on time could sit up front, and they wouldn't be disturbed by people coming in late, taking their seats in the back. Okay. You know, well, that's one. I have a stake in seeing that neighborhood watering holes and neighborhood performance places are used well. And I would think that it, um, it would generate traffic for uh, small uh, decentralized venues if uh, there was ambassador work from the ensembles that are playing in the institutions uh, beforehand or afterwards and going out into the smaller uh, uh, venues in communities and talking about what they do and talking about what it means you know when they put their hand on their head that we're gonna play the head now or you know some of those things that that doesn't have to be done in the institution where the performance is going to take place necessarily if there's the budget to uh, take care of travel and time for those artists to do something in advance and it also you know again as a journalist I've been saying for quite some time let the journalists do some of that teaching Mm -hmm. You know, and we're trying to get JJA members to have meetings in clubs all over Philadelphia, for instance, which has 46 clubs, but not any in a concentrated area. And the club owners complain that they're not getting any traffic. Well, let's get a bunch of JJA members to go out to a different club every month, say, and bring some traffic in with them, uh, present something to the locals there. Who, who go there because it is within their comfort zone. And um, as one of our commenters say, uh, you know, we're not talking about really different economic strata. We're just kind of assuming that people have the bread to do any of these things that they want, which may or may not be the case. Um, so, you know, what is there something that we can do to make better use of uh, the artists not making them play? Uh, some way that we can get them to address audiences uh, that aren't coming out for a full concert e experience uh, that may include uh, people who are not of drinking age, this sort of stuff? Can that be encouraged? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, you or JJA is in a very you know, good position, but JJA members have got to be comfortable moving beyond, as it were, um, reviewing the music. Yes, absolutely. It's got to be comfortable to become something which is a difficult line for journalists, and I understand why, which is moving from broadly a critical framework to an advocacy framework. Well, I think that there many, many, I would say most of the JJA members, uh, uh, are much more liable to be uh, criticized as being advocate, advocates than they are the traditional critical. Uh, there's very few yeah. journalists you know, who are being able to operate as, you know, we are above it all. Um, yeah. And the other thing is that also, a large number, let me just say, the large number of JJA members are, uh, besides uh, writing or photographing, they're also teachers. So uh, they are dealing with people who are not core jazz audience members already, um, you know, they're talking to complete naives in many cases. Usually that's at a college level, not at a secondary school level. You know, sometimes I find that, that in talking about jazz, some of the some of uh, its most uh, strident advocates are its worst enemy because they tend to, to actually add layers of complexity that don't need to be there to it. So in talking about it, they immediately start dropping names start uh, that, that people aren't familiar with. They will uh, uh, talk about the, the musical intricacies with people who don't really know uh, what a scale is. 
And, you know, I see this, these conversations going on with somebody who's very enthusiastic and they seem to be putting up more barriers when people just really want to know, you know, like you say, what's it mean? How, how do, when people are asking questions like, how do they know when to start? How do they know when to, to, start, um, to start improv? Is it all improv? Is it yeah. all improvisation? Yeah. Those are the kind of questions that, that, that once people understand it's a dialogue, it's a language. But, you know, and it's really hard, too, because I even find myself doing this when I'll go and describe somebody will say, uh, what's this music like? And I'll go, oh, it's straight ahead jazz. And they always go, oh, right? They don't know what I'm talking about. Right. I don't know what's, but for me, it's just like, oh, that's the most natural thing. Yeah, they'll get it. They'll get it. And uh, so I think we have to be very careful as we discuss jazz and train ourselves to talk to people who uh, don't know anything about this music. Agreed. And it's unfortunately true, but jazz does tend to attract, amongst lots of other people, a certain genre of people for whom knowledge is a weapon. In other words, that they sort of, you know, that, so, you know, jazz does play to that sort of use of esoteric knowledge to beat people back. Okay, well, you know, I'll accept the burden for that for, <laughs> for my membership. But I, I got to say, like, I'm teaching right now a course that uh, at NYU that has a very broad age group. And yeah. it's it's quite difficult to know what people know and what they don't know. Yeah. I mean, I did present a survey to my students and said, this is, you know, no answering right or wrong here. I just want to know what your backgrounds are. Do you recognize these musicians by name? Do you think you know what they sound like? Can you identify these instruments just by ear when you hear them? Do you know what that's, you know? And, like, without getting into deep questions, I mean, I find, like, I'm always fielding people at, at vastly different um, backgrounds. Uh, I get a comment from uh, Frederic, who's written several comments, but the main problem is that although this music was born here, it's completely, as well as classical music, disregarded by the main TV media, and so somewhat this improvised music being more sophisticated and expressive than rock and roll, country and hip-hop, never gets exposed to a bigger audience, and we keep accepting it and going around and around and uh, keep an audience coming. So I think Frederick's um, interest is in uh, um, is in uh, avant-garde, like free improvisation and that sort of thing. I totally disagree with him. I mean, I'm not saying that there's there's a lot of free free jazz on um, you know uh, on mainstream media, but we live in the golden age of of um, uh, doesn't matter how esoteric you can find massive resources these days. So okay, so um, it's not broadcast on the evening news, but you put on Pandora and you put in I don't know who we we're talking about the other day, um, Jarman, you know, or whoever, and there you're off. In other words, the deep unknown middle class of music as um, uh, who's the guy who runs Pandora? Tim um, Westergaard. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, you know, is now accessible to everybody free all the time. So, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, in you know, I'm 57, I'm an old fart. When I was growing up, you know, you had to absolutely, and I grew up in a rural area, God, you had to fight hard to get hold of, you know, whatever it was at the time. I can remember waiting for months to get a copy of Sorcerer. Um, uh, now, there's nothing you can't get in 30 seconds. So we live, you know, the business models are all screwed up, but we live in a fantastic age of total access to, to, to anything that your imagination could conceive, you can go and find now. So, you know, that has not always been the case. Well, uh, Megan, will you, will you talk to the uh, exposure of uh, free, free jazz and whether, you know, people in the, uh, in the revive audience seem to have a familiarity with that or, or an exposure to it? Um... I mean, it depends on the kind of artists we're working with. Um, I mean, it, it's really, it, it comes across, I mean, we talk, it, this goes back to our site and, you know, the, the kind of mission of, of our site, which is, again, it, a lot of what we do is about educating people about different artists and musicians from um, all spectrums, styles, different uh, styles of jazz, um, different artists in different periods and time frames, um, you know, uh, newer 
uh, you know, younger generation, you know, uh, musicians, uh, which was really the purpose and primary reason we started the site because there was no place to go to, you know, uh, to find out about what, what was happening on, on the front lines today. Um, so, I mean, from our standpoint, we cover, you know, a broad spectrum of the traditional component of the music and also, uh, you know, what's happening today. So, we do that from uh, an editorial you know, perspective, and we do it from a live perspective. It just depends on what we're presenting in particular. I, mean, I, I would like to see uh, places like the Coltrane House in Philadelphia or the Louis Armstrong House in um, Queens uh, be open to kids with uh, instruments there for the kids to bang on and with very little supervision uh, from a couple of decent uh, musicians. Um, whoops. Frederic says, no, I do not mean free jazz at all. So I guess Frederic is talking about uh, uh, direct improvisation. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Frederic, maybe you have to clarify that. But in any case, the I, you know, yeah, Adrian, we could, if we have a computer, we can find anything. If you go on, on Pandora and say, uh, you know, I want something Miles Davis and uh, Bessie Smith, you know, you begin to get a, a great wide stream of, of music suggested to you. But getting your hands on an instrument just to mess around, people don't have pianos in their homes the way they did when, mm -hmm. Adrian, when you and I were kids. Having an electric guitar is really a bit of an expensive, um, you know, and you can't get much out of an electric guitar unless you've got a certain amount of skill going on. Uh, uh, horns are not, you know, easily available and readily prevalent so that somebody can just pick it up and start blowing. Um, uh, you know, is that kind of education getting missed? Is that something that the places where we go to hear jazz can pay back into the community by setting up experiences of that sort? You mean um, instrument tuition? I'm not sure I follow it. Well... Availability, making it a clubhouse, you know, come in, let's listen to Miles Davis this afternoon, you know. We're just going to sit around and talk about it and, you know, drink Coca-Colas or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, um, uh, don't be too hard on for-profits. You know, for-profits have got a bottom line and, uh, you know, uh, that generalized wider audience development is really the responsibility of not-for-profits. It's why they're not-for-profits. It's why they exist under the, you know, the, the privileged tax conditions of 501c3 of the federal tax code. It's so they can do that stuff. So I think that, you know, that hinterland of wider education has got to fall on the shoulders of the not-for-profits. The for-profits basically don't have those tax privileges and um, they shouldn't be expected to carry a wider burden of generalized audience development. The reality is many of the people who run them do. Why? Because they're not in it for the money. They're in it because they love it. But um, that, even notwithstanding that, I think that not-for-profits are not-for-profits for a reason. And, you know, if I were a for-profit and I was looking at a not-for-profit with all its privileges, I would say, well, you know, commensurate with those privileges are carrying the burden of wider audience development. Well, I think that somewhere down the line, and maybe I'll call you back uh, into this, uh, Gene, because I think you're well situated to, uh, to, to, to consider it, we'll have a discussion about whether the for-profit and non-profit worlds can be brought together uh, to work together on audience development. Because I, personally, I don't see any reason that a non-profit cannot situate some of its activities in a for-profit venue mm -hmm. Absolutely. and you know, yeah. some, some synergy that way. Absolutely. I think that there are a lot of opportunities and the fact of the matter is, is that we're learning a lot about presenting jazz that's going to, that, that is going to be valuable. Uh, we, you know, a lot of learning that will be valuable for people who are presenting jazz in a for-profit uh, setting. So uh, we are very close to out of time here. Uh, I want to give people one more chance to uh, uh, ask a question, and if I can see the question, I'll certainly convey it. And I just want to remind people that uh, also 
these um, Talking Jazz presentations are being brought to you by the Jazz Cruise, that's the jazzcruise.com, and also Century Media Partners, and it's a production of the Jazz Journalists Association, and I'm not seeing any more uh, questions, so I will thank Megan Stabil from Revive Music Group, and Adrian Ellis from Adrian Ellis Consulting, and whoops, I think I just knocked myself off. No, no here I am. And, of course, uh, Gene Dobbs Bradford from Jazz St. Louis for being great panelists and guinea pigs to introduce this uh, uh, Google, on, uh, Google Hangout on Air series. We uh, are really very pleased with the software here. It seems to be working pretty well. And uh, one of the secret uh, meanings of the JJ doing this is to try to introduce um, use of inexpensive or free uh, and relatively simple software to any of our participants to use uh, 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 this, this uh, kind of software for your own meetings, for your own communications um, with people that you're working with or just socializing with. So it's pretty cool to have uh, people from uh, four different locations uh, all of able to see each other uh, in real time and to have this kind of discussion. And I think it's kind of fun. And again, thank you for helping us launch this series, Talking Jazz. Megan, Jean, Adrian, um, thanks a lot for your thoughts, and uh, more soon. Bye. Thank you, everybody.